The second section is how to diagnose and manage akathisia. So let's start with the etymology of the word akathisia. It's from ancient Greek for not to sit. It's really a syndrome characterized by this distressing, unpleasant sensation of restlessness. And usually people have to fidget, shuffle their feet, or move around to dispel this discomfort. The reported incidence across the literature ranges from 21 to 75 percent of people exposed to medications associated with akathisia. The point prevalence is between 20 and 35 percent. So this is one of the more common drug-induced movement disorders that you'll see in practice. Akathisia is usually associated with a lower quality of life, and it can be a pretty common reason for non-adherence to treatment. In extreme cases, there's actually been studies that show that it's associated with risk of suicide and aggressive behavior. The differential diagnosis when you have akathisia includes anxiety, so people who are really anxious can have symptoms of fidgeting and restlessness that can look like akathisia. Restless leg syndrome, people who are sort of pedaling their lower extremities can look like akathisia, but can actually be from this different syndrome. In neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and in people who are on levodopa, which is a dopamine precursor, you can see dyskinesias from exposure to that medication. Peripheral neuropathy, sometimes the discomfort of the neuropathy will cause people to move their limbs, and that can look like akathisia. Low iron is another sort of thing in the differential of akathisia. So we commonly will screen people for iron and iron binding proteins to make sure that it's not caused by that abnormality before we go forward with treatment. Hyperthyroidism can also look like akathisia. You can be restless and fidgety. So we'll typically take a look at thyroid stimulating hormone. Alcohol or opiate withdrawal, acute withdrawal especially, can look like akathisia. People will be restless and uncomfortable. And then stimulant intoxication. So while actively intoxicated from stimulants, people will often appear to be akathetic. So how do you distinguish things in the differential of akathisia from one another? Well, I mentioned that there's some things like low iron that you can simply do a blood test and thyroid problems and a history will tell you whether or not someone's been on a stimulant or is withdrawing from alcohol or opiates. But to distinguish akathisia from anxiety or agitation, you really have to rely on their subjective report of the inner sensation or compulsion to move. So it can be a little tricky, but again, once you know the differential, you can ask questions that can help you differentiate between a drug-induced akathisia and things that may look like akathisia. Now, even within the syndrome of akathisia, there's different subtypes. One is acute akathisia, and this is when the akathisia occurs within six months of exposure to the medication. So any time up to six months, we sort of call that acute akathisia. Chronic akathisia is if it persists for more than six months after the last dosage increment. And then tardive akathisia, tardive just means delayed, so you'll hear that term used across these movement disorders, is when the delay of onset is about three months, that's the average, not related to dose change. And then occasionally, not as often as the others, we'll see withdrawal akathisia, which is associated with switching antipsychotics or withdrawing the anticholinergics that we use sometimes along with antipsychotics. All of these can produce akathisia, and we talk about the subtype of akathisia based on these parameters. There's even a controversial condition called pseudoakathisia, where the movement phenomenology of restless pacing and fidgeting, but the patient, when asked, will deny awareness of the feeling of discomfort. So usually in classic akathisia, the patient will say, I feel like I have to move. I feel restless. I feel uncomfortable. And then I move to dissipate that feeling. In pseudoakathisia, the patient says that they're not aware of any feeling of discomfort. What are some of the medications associated with akathisia? Well, 
probably the highest prevalence of akathisia comes from typical and atypical antipsychotics. So anything that's blockading the dopamine receptor can cause this. Antidepressants, especially in high doses. Dopamine blocking antiemetics are another class of medications. And again, through a mechanism of dopamine blockade, reserpine, alpha-methyldopa, lithium, calcium channel blockers, and then any of these new VMAT2 inhibitors could potentially cause akathisia, but we especially see it in the first-generation tetrabenazine VMAT2 inhibitor. So have an awareness of this list when you see the syndrome of akathisia in patients, because these are likely the culprit. Now, even though akathisia can decrease quality of life and has these associations with other adverse outcomes, we don't necessarily recommend prophylactic treatment because it has the risk of side effects from the treatment of akathisia and polypharmacy. And so usually we don't treat akathisia until it manifests. So even if you're putting someone on one of these drugs that's known to cause akathisia a third of a time, let's take the high estimate, we don't recommend prophylactically treating for akathisia. How would you go about treating akathisia? What would be your algorithm? First, if you can, without compromising care, the efficacy for which you started the medication in the first place, you can lower the associated medication. So if they're on an antipsychotic and they've been doing well, you can have a trial reduction to see if that helps. You can switch to an antipsychotic with a lower liability. For instance, first-generation antipsychotics are, on average, more likely to cause akathisia than second-generation. So you can simply try switching from a first-generation, like Haldol, to a second-generation, like Olanzapine, for instance, and see if that helps. Check for iron deficiency. As I mentioned, there are certain things that can masquerade as akathisia. So getting blood work for iron deficiency, thyroid abnormalities at a minimum is a good idea. Now, you've done these three things and you still have the problem or you weren't able to lower the medication because the primary symptom was too severe. Then you need to treat with medications. And what medications are helpful? I'm going to give you a list in order of decreasing effect size or impact on akathisia. So mirtazapine has good evidence and a good effect size. Bipyridin is another one that's good. Vitamin B6 or pyridoxine is the other name for that one. Trazodone, minocerin, and propranolol. And so typically that's by effect size. Individual patients may tolerate some of these better than others or have contraindications. And so this is just based on demonstrated effect size. And this comes from a meta-analysis that was conducted in 2024. So depending on the acuity of the clinical illness, treatment of akathisia should really start with that dose reduction. And like I said, sometimes this is going to be possible and other times it's not. Now, the key points for this section, I think that it's important to know that akathisia occurs in up to 35% of patients taking antipsychotics and certain other types of medications. So this is something you're going to see very commonly in about a third of your patients. Akathisia is associated with a lower quality of life, with treatment discontinuation or non-adherence, and an increased risk of suicide and aggressive behaviors. First-line treatments for akathisia include vitamin B6, mirtazapine, and bipyridin. 